We've got some introductions to make this morning. Uh, and she gets, I think, the prize for being, coming the farthest to visit us this morning. And we have none other than Carmen, who is visiting us for six months here. Please go ahead and stand out up. Please go ahead and stand up. We want to welcome you. Welcome. All the way from Cuba. Amen. Hey, we're, it's good to see you. Well, this is the third part of our epic battles that we're uh, looking at in the scriptures and the whole idea of looking at these incredible battles ultimately is to see that our God goes from victory to victory to victory, that there is no challenge that is too big for him. So what's the point of all that? It's not necessarily that he flexes his muscles, so to speak. It's so that ultimately we could put our trust and our faith in him, that he's a God that is worthy of us ultimately putting our trust in him. This morning, we're going to be talking about the taming of lions. We'll get some insight on how we can tame some lions. And we pray that as we continue this series, you'll be inspired more and more and more. Amen. So we pick it up in Daniel chapter 5. In Daniel chapter 5, in verse 16, but we'll give you guys a little bit of background here. Daniel chapter 5 and verse 16. We remember very well that at this point in time that God, because of Israel's sin and their unrepentant heart, he had actually used the Babylonians in order to hold them captive. And the idea is that ultimately, because of their trials and their temptations and the difficulties that they're having in their lives, that they will fall on their knees and actually give honor to God. You know, that is not unlike even sometimes in our lives, especially when things are going in a challenging manner. And I put before you that all those times is that ultimately that we will look to our God fall on our knees and understand that he alone is in control of people's lives. And so what happens here ultimately, they're in, they're in captivity. Um, undoubtedly, at least by most scholars, the Babylonian Empire was the most powerful empire to ever walk the face of the earth. Nebuchadnezzar, was the king at this point, point in time. And he was, of course, in charge of a big land, uh, of a lot of territory. We remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that they ultimately would not bow down to this image of gold. Instead, they paid honor to God, even if it meant for them to die. And we see that story there, and that's the idea. That's the context of this. And so Jeremiah, in his time, he had talked about how God was going to use the Babylonian Empire to uh, discipline the nation of Israel. And ultimately, that's going to happen for 70 years. Well, ultimately, Nebuchadnezzar passed away, and his son came in to be the king now of Babylon. So that's the context here. We're a few years, actually, uh, a few decades into the Babylonian uh, leadership of Israel. And so one of the things that you've got to understand is that these people were not like us this morning, coming here, singing songs freely, and just worshiping God whenever we want, and certainly not having coffee and cake. <laughs> but rather, these guys were held in captivity, and they're challenge to worship their God was very, very real. Especially when the kings of those ages actually view themselves, a lot of them, even as gods. That people ought to pay homage to them, not just respect, but in a very real way, worship them. And can you imagine 
the challenge that must have been for those who knew the true God, the true Jehovah, and yet give God the honor that is due him. So Belshazzar, which is Nebuchadnezzar's son, has now taken over the Babylonian Empire. And of course, one of the things that we have uh, done in this congregation, especially over the, uh, the epic series, I send you the scriptures beforehand so you can read, you understand the context of all of this. And if you want to go ahead and even do some background study, awesome. And so we come in here and we're prepared. We worship God not only with our hearts, but also with our minds. And so we see now the son of Nebuchadnezzar is in Babylon. He's leading them, and there is an issue. The issue, of course, is interpreting dreams. Okay, uh, that's, that's what God is able to do um, a lot of times. And honestly, when I, even in this day and age, I see myself as a dream interpreter. And I'll tell you why. This week I was studying the Bible with a young man. And as we're studying the Bible, I talked to him about, hey, what is the dream for your life? Tell me what you would like to do with your life. And tell me as you're studying the Bible and as you see what God is doing in your life. And as we navigate through the scriptures, he actually is talking about me helping him with his dream in his life, the path that he's taking, some of the things that are good, and some of the things that he needs to change in his life. And so as I, who have been uh, become a disciple, I now help him to interpret the dream and how to navigate through that. Amen. I, I feel awesome about that. <laughs> Daniel chapter 5, verse 16. We pick it up. Daniel, uh, there, uh, this king wants, there's a, there's a uh, dream. He wants to know what's the meaning of the dream that he had. So we pick it up in verse 16. It says, now I have heard that you are able to give interpretations and to solve dic difficult problems. If you can read this writing and tell me what it means, you'll be clothed in purple and have a gold chain placed around your neck and you'll be made the third highest ruler in the kingdom. Of course here, they're talking about Daniel. Now you gotta understand this challenge here. Daniel was not from Babylon. He was an Israelite. And Daniel, the Bible tells us, so distinguished himself that they had no choice, if you would, but to promote him in a significant leadership in the Babylonian Empire. And one of the reasons why was his ability to interpret dreams. And so here was another challenge. And this king said, hey, listen, Daniel, if you can do this, man, you will be rewarded. And you thought the guys who wear gold chains around their necks are, it's a modern thing. Listen, it happened ever since the time of the Babylonian Empire. Daniel had an interesting response. This is what he says. Then Daniel answered the king, you may keep your gifts for yourself and give your rewards to someone else. Nevertheless, I will read the writing for the king and tell him what it means. The language of a lot of people today is rewards and gifts. And Daniel was not going to be someone who was going to be bought bribed or uplifted in his spirits because of material things. There's a lesson there for us. In verse 18 it says, Your Majesty, the Most High God, give your father Nebuchadnezzar sovereignty and greatness and glory and splendor. One of the things you're going to notice here about good old Daniel, he was not afraid to kindly speak the truth. An art that is lost in the world and maybe even in the kingdom of God. Pick it up in verse 20. This is what it says. But when his heart, speaking here of Nebuchadnezzar, became arrogant and hardened with pride, 
He was deposed from his royal throne and stripped of his glory. I mean, last night as I went to my dad's 85th birthday, and we celebrated there in Toronto, my dad's 85, my mom's almost 80, and living independently, it's certainly awesome to be able to go and honor your parents. It's always sobering as my dad was sharing and he said, you know, I don't know if this is the last birthday they will celebrate. And of course, that's a stark reality when someone's 85 years old. And so what we want to do, we want to lift up my dad, right? When you're in a birthday, that's what you want to do. You want to talk good things and, and, and true things, but good things. Daniel was not talking about good things about Belshazzar's father. And that's always a challenge, of course. And so he says, listen, your dad, he became arrogant and became prideful. Verse 22, but you, Belshazzar, his son, have not humbled yourself, though you knew all this. He said, listen, The acorn hasn't fallen that far from the tree. The difference is Nebuchadnezzar did it in ignorance. You are not ignorant of the fact how pride and a hardened heart and how God looks toward it. He says, you've not humbled yourself. Instead, you have set yourself up against the Lord of heaven. You had the goblets from his temple brought to you, and you and your nobles, your wives, and your concubines drank wine from them. You praised the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which cannot see or hear or understand. But you did not honor the God who holds in his hands your life and all your ways. Wow. I mean, when you, that is not a cordial guest. This actually is a familiar refrain of God's prophets in people's lives. I don't know if you're anything like me. I want to be liked. Don't we all? That's why we wear the hair we do wear the clothes we do, act the way we do, hopefully somewhere, somehow. Oh, I know some of us, we really pride ourselves. I don't really care. Really? Why do you make the decisions that you do? Ultimately, to gain notoriety and respect of other people. And yet I see in God's Word that God's man and God's woman is unapologetic about what his honor needs to bring about in people, especially people of high repute. This guy was the leader of the most powerful empire on the face of the earth. And Daniel said, hey, listen, bud, you're going to go the way of your father, and you're worse off because you knew what happened to your father. If you don't know what happened with Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar, because of his arrogance, God sent him out to, to live among the ox and the cattle for three and a half years because of his pride. Ultimately, he repented and came back. But we find that Daniel is about to interpret this dream, and he does not, he is greasing the sword, so to speak. <laughs> so to tell Belshazzar what is about to come. This was not shock and awe. In other words, he was not going to come in and just tell him the bad news, the really bad news at the start, and then give him some better news. It's getting worse. Look what it says. Ultimately, what he said of Belshazzar, he said, listen, 
You, your days are numbered. Your reign as the king of Babylon are numbered. Not only that, you have been weighed, you have been measured, and you have been found wanting. That is not a compliment. You have been weighed, you have been measured, and you lack in your measurement and your weight. As a matter of fact, this kingdom that you are part of is going to be taken from you. And literally, as was prophesied in the first dream, that this empire, this Babylonian empire, this head of gold was going to last for 70 years. And it was 70 years. And literally, what happened that very night, Belshazzar was killed. And the Medo-Persian Empire now started overtaking and conquered the Babylonian Empire. So not only was God's prophecy in the fact that the Babylonian Empire was going to oversee our, the king of the Israelite Empire, and that it ended exactly at 70 years. And God said, listen, because of your arrogance and because of your pride. And listen, I'm telling you today, this warning is for us as well. Today we have a very popular church hopping kind of mentality within our society. If somebody says something that I don't like, I can go somewhere else. I do that all the time. If I don't like my phone company, I threaten them that I'm going to go somewhere else. It's amazing the things that you have. or go to a restaurant, I don't like the way I was treated or what have you, I easily can go to another one. And sometimes just the mere threat of it changes people's disposition. As a matter of fact, I went to Rogers the other day and I said to Rogers, I said, I don't like the television programming that we have. And the woman at Rogers gave me some insight on how to talk to the customer service to get the best of what they were offering. She said, no, this is what you need to do. You need to press this and talk to this, and you're going to get a better bank for your buck. And so sometimes we bring that same mentality even to God's Word. And we want our ears to be itched. We want somebody to say something that I like. Now, I'm going to say that with this caveat. That does not give people like me the right to say ridiculous, stupid, unthoughtful things. As a matter of fact, I'm well aware that people like me who stand here as ministers have done much to discredit the gospel of Jesus Christ. That there are people like me, why a lot of people don't believe in organized religion. And the hypocrisy. And the severed relationships and because of what men who purport to be prophets of God. And so I am fully aware, or at least significantly aware, I'm not sure that fully, I'm significantly aware of the responsibility that lies in this pulpit. You come here every Sunday morning hoping to hear something that is going to be encouraging, challenging, uplifting to your hearts.
And there's a sober responsibility that I have. But church, there's a responsibility that you also have. And that if we sit in the pews and we hear week after week after week what God is calling us to do and we're unrepentant like Belshazzar, what destiny do you think awaits us? And we're not doing it in ignorance. And so we have a serious responsibility. I know I do. But the challenge sometimes is that I'm the new minister here. How am I going to make sure that my message goes down? Is it with some wine? Is it with water? Is it with Diet Coke? It's got to be with Diet Coke. But you know what I'm talking about. Oh, I didn't even have those things in my notes. It's just that I just needed to say those things. All right, let's go back. All right. <laughs> Daniel chapter 6. And so now we realize, literally, immediately, the Medo-Persian Empire now is, uh, uh, the Israelites are under this new empire. And so Daniel was so distinguished among the people that the new leader of this empire had three guys that were in charge of a lot of provinces. And one of those guys was not their own. He had so distinguished himself that he was chosen, Daniel was chosen. So give us some context. Give us some. When Daniel, in the times of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Daniel was about a teenager. Now, you realize, not because you're necessarily a biblical scholar, all you got to do is a little math. Since they were going to be captured for how many years? 70 years. He's a teenager. He's well into his 80s because it's a new empire, right? And so what happens, this is not a young man anymore. This is an, this is an older man. He's into his 80s. I'm flat out inspired by that. We pick it up in chapter 6, verse 3. Says, so Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to put him over the whole kingdom. At this, the administrators and the satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs, but they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. Finally, these men said, we will never find any basis for charges against this man, Daniel, unless some, it has something to do with the law of his God. And so what happens, Daniel now becomes one of the key administrators. They find out that Daniel, ultimately, they want to put Daniel in charge of this whole shebang. This does not go well. Power struggle in the kingdom of God, imagine that. On my trip to Toronto, I met with some Christians. On Friday evening, we went up late, and so we figured we might make the most of this, might make the most of this trip. And so we were talking to some disciples who self-admittingly struggling in their faith. And one of the resounding reasons is this tussle of control and power. Are we not learning? It's 3,000 years later and the story can be written over and over and over again.
and it was no different. These guys said, hey, listen, you are going to rule over us. You're not even one of us. And so they tried to find a basis of charge against him. They realized they couldn't do it because he had so distinguished himself. Can you imagine that, guys? That people were, are looking at your life. Because they wanted him, of course. They wanted him to be found guilty. And that people were looking at these guys' lives. And I, I, I want to, this was very interesting. Can you imagine that someone examines your life? And this was incredibly encouraging to me. Uh, discouraging to me because I realize how far I am from Daniel. That if someone were to check into my high school and university records or how I treat my children or the phone calls I make, my shopping habits, my records of my financial statements, internet usage, my favorite TV programs, where I go on vacation, what videos I download, that comb through my relationships that are all that I've ever had, what would they find? Tax returns, every corner of my bedroom, business deals, police record, how I act in my job, how I deal with the opposite sex, the words that I speak, my jokes, how I treat my spouse, where I live. If someone were to scrutinize my life, what will they find? Daniel, in hostile environment, undoubtedly his life was scrutinized and they said they could not find a basis of any charge. Simply stunning. Verse 10. Now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, and the decree was because these guys were looked at as king, they wanted to trap and realize what we need to do is make sure that he is not doing what he ought to be doing in regard to his God. They, of course, scouted him and realized that Daniel prays all the time. And he doesn't do it in private. He does it in public. Not so that people would see, but through the lattice of his window, he opens it out. And the Bible tells us he, he does it towards Jerusalem. Ultimately, perhaps one day, realizing that Jerusalem was in ruins, and we need to go back and build the walls that is in Jerusalem. And he's paying homage not to a particular place, but to know where this is where these people should ultimately be. And so these guys had Darius, the king, the Medo uh, uh, Persian king, issue a decree. The decree saying, if anybody's going to pray to a god, it needs to be to King Darius. Remember that little thing I told you before? These guys saw themselves as, uh, as gods. And if anyone in the next 30 days does this, they are going to be put to death. Listen, if ever you want to get somebody to do something for you, flattery goes a long way. These guys said, hey, good old D, what's up? You're, the, you're a god, right? Yes. And everybody should pay homage to a god. He, a god deserves to be worshipped and adored and prayed to. See, the problem was Darius was fond of Daniel. And his pride was so thick and flattery so effective that he issued a decree not knowing he was absolutely being set up. And ultimately that's what happens, right? 
In verse 10, it says, Now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before. Then these men went as a group and found Daniel praying and asking God for help. How did they know that this was happening? So they went to the king and spoke to him about his royal decree. Oh, did you not publish a decree that during the next 30 days, anyone who prays to any god or human being except to you, your majesty, would be thrown into the lion's den. The king answered, the decree stands in accordance with the laws of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be repealed. Then they said to the king, Daniel, oh, by the way, who's one of the exiles from Judah? Boy, racism has always been a part of people's life, isn't it? You, know, you, you like when people throw in cold words? He says, by the way, you know, he's not even one of us as well. <laughs> he pays no attention to you. Your majesty or to the decree you put in writing, he still prays three times a day. When Daniel was issued a decree that was challenging to him, he didn't go by the latest book on how not to pray to human kings for dummies. You know those books, those series, right? That was not his. It didn't even say that he went and consulted people. He just knew right away that he should not bow down to decrees and laws that are not in accordance with the Word of God. You know, I was studying the Bible with, a, with another guy, and he said to me, man, there's something that we've done, and I don't want to do this, because after studying the Bible, I realized this is not the right thing we ought to do. But here's the problem. We've paid for it. And I said, let me ask you a question. Let's say we're studying the Bible and you bought cocaine. And you now realize you studied the Bible. Are we going to say, oh, since I bought it, I might as well you? He says, obviously not. He says, the, I said, it is never too late to repent. Never. But I've already. But I've invested. Such was the integrity of this man. You know, this was learned from a very young age. When Daniel was getting the king's food, he says, listen, this stuff is not what we need to be eating. You know what I, you know what I realized in Daniel? Daniel always tried to stay into the center of God's will, not just figuring out what the edges are. And so therefore, when things came by, it was not some kind of big deal. This is clear. I mean, there's, the solution to this is obvious. Go pray to God. The very thing that we should be accused of. But we are masters, and I include myself, in being able to defend myself for decisions that I make that I know that are on the edge. I put before you 95% of the decisions that you make, that you seek counsel on, 95, you know the answer to. You just want to tickle your ear. Oh, admittedly, there's some things that we need. I'm not talking about that. That's why I said 95%. But you know 
And certainly what confuses the whole situation is not unlike Daniel when we're not in the center of God's will and these decisions. And this was learned at a very, very young age. And I know sometimes what happens in situations like this. Tony, I'm so far gone, you know, I, I just got to make the best of the situation. That's not understanding who God is. You know, the good old Chinese proverb, right? When is the best time to plant a tree? Well, 18 years ago. <laughs> when is the second best time to plant a tree if you've not planted one? Today. And we can talk about all the reasons why we shouldn't do things. And make all the excuses. But Daniel was incredible. And of course, we know what Daniel does. We pick it up in verse 16. Then the men went as a group to King Darius and said, Remember, your majesty, that according to the laws of the Medes and the Persians, no decree or edict that the king issued can be changed. So the king gave the order and they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. The king said to Daniel, may your God whom you continually serve rescue you. A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and the rings of his nobles so that Daniel's situation might not change. Then the king returned to his palace and spent the night without eating and without any entertainment being brought to him and he could not sleep. At the first light of dawn, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. When he came near the den, he called to Daniel in an anguished voice, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, have been able to rescue you from the lions? By the way, people are watching. People are watching if you call yourself a Christian, how you live your life. Even the king took note of the fact that Daniel served his living God continually. In verse 21, Daniel answered, May the king live forever. My God sent his angel and he shut the mouths of the lions. They have not hurt me because I, have found, I was found innocent in his sight, nor have I done anything wrong before you, your majesty. The king was overjoyed and gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den. And when Daniel was lifted from the den, no wound was found on him because he had trusted in his God. You know how you tame lions? You're faithful in prayer. You're faithful to your God. And you try to be faultless in the way you live your life. That's how you tame lions. When I was studying the Bible with this young man, he said, to, I, said he, he said, I find myself in some challenging situations. And I asked him a question, I said, to see whether or not he's understanding what's going on. I said, how did you get here? He says, most of it is my fault. I said, good. Because initially it was, they're doing this and they're doing that and they're, they're all doing this thing to me. We live in a society where it's everybody else's fault. She looked at me funny. She's talking behind my back. He is so mean. This is how, this is how unconscionable they were. This is how they treated me. We live in a society that do not take responsibility for their actions. And we blame our political leaders. 
They make, really? Daniel defeats that. He says, listen, I don't care if it's the Israelite kingdom. I don't care if it's the Babylonian kingdom. I don't care if it's the Medo-Persian kingdom. My faithfulness to God remains irrespective of who is leading us. Does that condone the wickedness of leaders? Not at all. You haven't heard a word I've said. But the idea of taking responsibility of our spiritual life has got to be at the forefront of our lives. As we're getting together with disciples, one of the great things that I've heard are people who've owned their own faith in some challenging situation and said, awesome, that's who we have got to be. Daniel, in spite of a decree being issued by a king, we saw his devotion to God unwavered. And ultimately, because of his unwavering devotion, we see God delivering him in his time of desperate need. Do you I mean, when I see Daniel about, uh, uh, he said, man, seriously, you're going to try this again? <laughs> Not only that, I'm 80 years old, so what, man? I, if I'm done, I'm done. But uh, the thought of me going, I've lived my life this so long, devoting myself to God. You want me now to turn back? That is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard, yet there are times that we do that even in our own spiritual lives. So you want me to give up on my God now when you're throwing me into the lion's den? Does that make any sense to you? Yet it's sometimes what we do when we try to shortcut God and we try to circumvent what he actually says in situations. And we give up on the time that we need him the most. That's what Satan does to our minds. You know, as we're about to Take the Lord's Supper as I reminded you. All these scriptures, all these stories ultimately tell of who Jesus Christ is. Do you see the type of Christ that Daniel was? That he was blameless? That he was wrongly accused? That they plotted against him to try and get rid of him? That when he was put before Pontius Pilate, Pilate says, listen, I have no basis for a charge against this man. Is that not what Darius said? Listen, I I want to save this guy. And you can look at this two ways that figuratively he was raised from the dead when he was put in the lion's den. Same kind of verbiage that Abraham uh, used of Isaac. That figuratively he was raised from the dead because God provided a way out. Or we realize that because this is what makes Daniel a type of Christ, he did not have to ultimately suffer, yet Christ suffered for us. All these stories, they point towards our God and ultimately Jesus Christ. Church, will you cling to him? In times when you're being squeezed financially and not compromise, physically and not compromise, are you listed? A lot of times, husbands make excuses for adultery because of their relationship with their spouse. And some of it, it's because of her. And wives do the same thing. Well, the reason why I'm not giving is because of him. 
we're not taking responsibility for our own spiritual lives and in spite of challenges that come our way that we will not give up on who our God is irrespective of who is over me. A Merido Persian king, a Babylonian king, or his son, a madman, Daniel, that's how you tame a lion. Through prayer, through faithfulness, through living a life of integrity. That's how you tame a lion. You know, they say that preparation is the key to anxiety when you go and write tests. A lot of times you are less anxious because you were prepared. That's how you tame your anxiety, okay? Similarly, a lot of times, especially, God forbid, as Christians, we think, hey, I'm now a Christian. God's going to help me with my test, and I'm not going to study. Have you lost your ever-loving mind? <laughs> we think God's, like, like, he's a cosmic bellhop. He's a joke. because of people's ignorance, it blows my mind how we fall prey to charlatans who project themselves as prophets. I'm talking real clear charlatans. There are some that are better than others in terms of how they hide it. But it's like, seriously, have you ever read your Bible? You believe that? You shut the mouths of lions by the way you live your life and you conduct and you ultimately trust in your God. And is that not what we do when we surrender our lives to Christ? We say, I'm going to repent of my sins and I'm going to get baptized in the waters of baptism so that my sins can be forgiven. Nothing magical happens in that water. It's the fact that we trust God's words. That's what it is. We say, God, that's what you say. Then that's what we're going to do. It doesn't even matter where I get baptized. It doesn't matter. I'm trusting in you, God. That's what the communion does. That's what it's a reminder of every single week. And so as we partake of the Lord's Supper, and as the brothers and sisters are coming up and reminding us what this time is all about, is we're saying, God... I trust in your promises. God, I am banking on what you say. And so we'll tame lions by our ultimate trust in our great God. Let us pray. Father, we're just so grateful that your son, unlike Daniel, was not rescued because he prayed, is there another way? And the father said, there is no other way. If we're going to rescue these people here, that this sacrifice was made for us. And as great as Daniel was, we realize, Christ, you are even greater. Because of your act of faithfulness to your Father, because of your act of your fervent belief in what God's promises are, you went to the cross knowing that he will raise you from the dead, and ultimately that resurrection applies to us today. Thank you for the bread and for the wine that represents the body and the blood of Christ. Thank you for your promises. Thank you for people like Daniel. We thank you for your word that is a lamp unto our feet. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.